Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, webinar on the subject of new developments in CISPR product uh, standards. Uh, my name is uh, Jens Metler. I'm belonging to the product management team for our EMI test receivers. I'm now almost uh, 25 years with Roder and Schwarz, and my special subject is the standardization support for our EMI test equipment. Um, this brings me around uh, to CISPR uh, standard meetings. Um, so I'm expert member of um, several subcommittees for the measurement equipment and also for product standard testing. Yeah, CISPR. What is the purpose of CISPR? Actually, it is under the roof of the IAC and it stands for International Special Committee on Radio Interference. It's a committee uh, constituted of seven subcommittees, uh, both horizontal and vertical role. It was established in 1933, and uh, today uh, it has a membership of uh, 40 countries, national committees, and uh, also special membership of organizations like uh, the European Broadcast Union, and particular ITU radio and ITU telecommunication section are very important. What is the, the mission of uh, CISPA? Uh, it was established to consider the protection of radio interference. Uh, look to the man in front of the AM radio. This explains why it was established in the early 30s of the last century. Because in the uh, late 20s, uh, it, the AM radio was introduced to the public and um, the first interference case uh, was recognized because electric devices already existed. As explained, uh, CISPA is under the roof of the ISC, but it's not the, the only committee dealing with EMC. We have also um, DC77. That is uh, in charge of standards for immunity testing, and we have DC65 on large installations. Um, CISPA standards uh, are on international level. The question is how they come uh, in place uh, to be used for product testing for the certification process. For this purpose, you have to bring them in, uh, uh, to a legal standard, and this is done by the national standardization bodies. Um, for example, in the uh, US by FCC, in Japan for IT equipment by the VCCI. In Europe, we go a slightly different way. Uh, we go through our uh, European uh, standardization bodies, uh, particular here, uh, Senelec or for electric devices and uh, Etsy for the telecommunication on, and radio standards. Going through these organizations, we uh, translate uh, CISPR standards into EN standards. And finally, uh, it is uh, translated into the national language um, so, for example, in Germany through our TKE, the German Committee for Electrotechnik. It is organized in that way that we have uh, basic standards. Um, those basic standards are developed by CISPA Subcommittee A. And uh, here we're talking about our CISPA 16 series, um, altogether 17 parts in place. And those uh, standards. Uh, they include uh, the requirements for the measurement equipment, like the receiver, measurement antennas, um, but also measurement methods, uh, requirements on the test site, and uh, belonging uncertainties. We have, uh, as a second, uh, we have uh, CISPR subcommittee H. Uh, that is in charge of the generic standards. And here, actually, we have two standards in place. Uh, this is part 61000-6-3 on residential, commercial, and light industrial environments, and uh, the part 6-4 on industrial environments. Uh, there will uh, be a change uh, in the near future uh, because uh, we will split off uh, 6-3 into two parts. Uh, under 6-3, uh, only the residential standards will remain and the light industrial 
uh, environments and commercial environments, that will be uh, under part 6-8 in the future. Yeah, and finally we have our product standards. And here we have subcommittees uh, B, D, F and I. And in these standards, we define the specific requirements on the products like the operation of the EOT, like uh, the arrangement of the setup, um, but also in justified cases, um, deviation from limits and uh, also specific requirements on the uncertainty. Yeah, how does it look like? You see on the bottom, we have basic standards. But basic standards cannot be used for the certification process itself because uh, it does not include uh, um, limits. Yeah? For the product testing, you first you look if your product match uh, with the scope in a product standard. Uh, if this is the case, you use that product standard. If not, you have the option to apply uh, one of the generic standards. The question is how uh, a basic standard come into force. And here in principle we have uh, two choices um, that come in force with dated or undated uh, references. If you have an undated reference, the latest basic standard shall apply. Um, if you have a dated reference, specific um, standard uh, shall apply. Um, I can tell you these days all CISPR product standards have uh, dated uh, references. Uh, you see CISPR 11, um, 14 1, 15, and 32. They all have a dated reference, and I prepared uh, an example for you. This is taken from CISPR 32. Uh, you see here the clause 2 normative references, and here you have the example. This is the reference, um, dated reference to uh, CISPR 16 1, 1. Uh, for the measurement equipment. In Europe, we have uh, an additional process. Uh, we also define a date of withdrawal. Uh, this is actually the date uh, by which the national con uh, standard conflicting with the new standard shall be, to be withdrawn. Why we have implemented it, that is uh, here for uh, the establishment of a transition period. And in principle, it's quite easy. So it's uh, based on the date of ratification, DOR uh, ratification by the European Commission, plus a three years transition. If uh, you want to see or if you want to get a look on uh, those uh, date of withdrawal, uh, please use this uh, link um, and you can then do a database search you will see then the standard with all the publication dates, the ratification date, and the date of withdrawal. Yeah, this so far, a uh, short introduction into CISPR for what it stands for. Uh, please uh, keep in mind uh, what is the mission. Our mission is to protect the radio, so we want to serve a good quality of broadcast um, and of uh, mobile communication. Uh, in today's technical uh, part, I uh, selected uh, for you four commercial standards. So it's 11 on industrial scientific and medical equipment, 14-1 uh, on household appliance and electric tools, um, CISPR 15 on the lighting equipment, and uh, CISPR 32 on multimedia. Yeah, let's start with CISPR 11. Um, here we have currently in place uh, edition 6, uh, which was published uh, on 9th of June in 2015. And you see here in Europe now, um, it was published in uh, early 2016. And the DOW was set to February 15, 2019. So it's just a few months in place. In other words, um, uh, the use of edition 6 is mandatory, so do not use edition 5 anymore. Um, yeah, what's new in this uh, sixth edition? Um, it's first a move uh, of uh, induction cooking appliances. Um, so those, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, or such equipment was removed from 11 
and is now under the scope of CISPR 14-1. Um, and I think that is reasonable because here it's indeed, it's rather uh, household appliances than uh, industrial scientific or medical equipment. Uh, we have also updated the references to CISPR 16. And this is a quite important update because it makes uh, the use of FFD-based uh, receivers uh, applicable for compliance testing. And here I want to give you uh, a little insight a few on such um, type of receivers. So what is the motivation? Um, in general, we can say more speed, more reliable, more insight. Um, speed uh, is related uh, to the fact that in the past, um, we applied the resolution bandwidth to a single frequency, and then we stepped through the entire frequency range, which ends up in a long measurement time. Not so with FFT. With FFT, we use a much wider frequency segment and we calculate all frequencies in parallel within this uh, segment. Um, yeah, more reliable. That is always good if you uh, apply a longer measurement time. Yeah? Think about if you have intermittent signal. So here, applying a longer measurement time then you get more rel reliable um, measurement results. And I will introduce later on uh, enhanced functions like a persistence display and a scan spectrogram. Yeah, um, how they come in place. Uh, CISPR 16.1.1 uh, actually is uh, using a black box approach. That means um, if the receiver fulfill the requirements in 16.1.1, it can be used for compliance testing. Um, to make this clear, we have uh, introduced the term measuring receiver, which comprises uh, actually uh, quite a lot of different technologies. So, for example, we have here the EMI receiver, the spectrum analyzers, or an FFT-based uh, measuring receiver. Um, for the FFT-based instrument, we have a very specific requirement. It shall sample and evaluate the signal continuously during the measurement time. And why this is so important? Because uh, actually with traditional instruments, there are blind times. There are gaps between capturing signals. And uh, in EMC, that could be really critical because we want to measure pulses. And uh, so you can see here, if the pulse uh, is, appears during the blind time, you will simply miss it. Yeah, um, we have a FFD um, segment, which is much wider than the resolution bandwidth. But on the end, I, it is not wide enough to cover the entire frequency range. I mean, it's okay for conductive measurements uh, up to 30 megahertz, so it's one segment, one shot, uh, game over. But how about uh, radiated emission measurements when uh, you have to apply uh, or have to cover a frequency range from 30 megahertz to one gig? So here, actually, we combine the um, step uh, scan and the FFT, uh, let's say, evaluation in uh, segments. And the, ex, uh, the figure here shows you an example. Here we apply three segments and uh, let's say each segment has a width of uh, 30 megahertz. Then we can cover in this example a total frequency range of uh, um, 90 megahertz. On the end, it will reduce uh, the scan time um, because now we apply the measurement time not to a single frequency, now we apply it to uh, the number of segments. So on the end, you are much uh, faster. Uh, let me uh, next speak about the measurement time itself, because measurement time is a quite important uh, subject. Uh, the issue here is if your measurement time is too short, you may not capture the signal, or you may uh, measure, uh, let's say, wrong results. Um, this picture here shows you 
uh, a pulse modulated carrier with a 12 milliseconds uh, pulse period and I uh, apply the time domain scan with a measurement time of 12 milliseconds. And if you look to the uh, uh, frequency response, um, that looks fine, so it's a closed trace. Let me now reduce the measurement time uh, to 10 milliseconds. And what you see here now, um, it's not a closed trace anymore. It's uh, now uh, we have here gaps, uh, or here a gap. So we can say we have really uh, enormous errors. Um, and even we have uh, a closed trace, uh, for example, in this area, um, zooming in, it is not a closed trace. So still gaps are in the trace. So please be aware or very, uh, measurement time always larger uh, than the signal period. Yeah, I told you one uh, of the motivation is uh, measurement uh, speed. And here I have some examples for you. Uh, look at uh, a typical conducted measurement preview uh, with the peak detector, uh, measurement time 100 milliseconds, uh, range 150k to 30 megahertz, and look at this step scan 12 minutes down to just 0.1 second. This brings us in a position to do uh, the measurement with uh, the final detectors direct. Yeah? And you see the second example here, quasi-peak and CISPR average for uh, conducted measurements. And uh, you see uh, in the past almost four hours and these days uh, you do it in two seconds. Um, yeah, also for radiated emission, you can really speed up uh, the measurements. I have here this example for you, uh, radiated emission from 30 megahertz to one gig with quasi-peak and CISPR average in parallel. Um, yeah, it was simply not possible in the old days, 100 hours, that can nobody do. So, and brings us down to uh, almost one minute. So this is really great uh, achievement. Yeah, um, let's talk about the applicability. Um, you see here more or less all product standards already, uh, let's say, referencing the uh, latest uh, CISPR 16.1.1. Um, so that means uh, for all our commercial product standards, uh, uh, 11, uh, 15, 14-1, and 32, the use of FFT-based uh, receivers is applicable for compliance testing. Um, however, if you use a, um, a, st a standard which is uh, older, um, you can also gain from uh, the um, fast FFT-based uh, receiver technology by applying the time domain scan for preview measurements. Um, how about other standards? So here, uh, particular, I have to focus on FCC uh, measurements. Um, FCC measurements are based on the um, basic standard ANSI C63.2. Uh, um, this is the basic standard for the measurement equipment uh, to be used uh, for FCC testing. And you see, this standard has uh, undated reference to 16.1.1. And so that uh, means you can use FFT-based technology receivers for um, compliance measurement against FCC uh, standards. Yeah, um, next uh, I'd like to introduce a little bit uh, the measurement, enhanced measurement functions um, which m give you more insight uh, in uh, the signal characteristic. And the first uh, I like to introduce here is uh, the persistence spectrum. Uh, persistence spectrum here, the, the color shows how often a signal occur at a specific uh, frequency and level. And how does it look in the, in the spectral histogram? You see here, this is a pulse signal with a high uh, probability, so that signal occur very often, and so that becomes visible, even uh, it is under the max hold threshold. And for this purpose, I have uh, an example prepared for you. 
Um, this is actually a windshield wiper motor, which has a broadband noise characteristic. You see here the blue, uh, that is the max hold uh, uh, noise, and the yellow is the clear right trace. And look now to the persistence display. Um, you see here the same broadband characteristic and the clear right characteristic. But look at this. Here is a pulse signal. Actually, this is hidden uh, in the normal spectrum display, but becomes visible in the persistence uh, display because of uh, uh, is its high probability. So it's very good for development, for interfering, uh, let's say, hunting, um, for uh, investigation um, during the development stage. Yeah, and uh, one more uh, item here is um, the uh, or enhanced function is the scan spectrogram. Also here I have a, a practical use for you. This is actually a rear window wiper operation and uh, I used for the demonstration a split screen. You see here the normal spectrum display and this is the uh, scan spectrogram or you can also say um, it's a kind of waterfall where we, uh, let's say, um, display the level over time. And I start now this little video and you see here those uh, uh, red uh, high uh, levels, high interference level. So this is actually the water pump. Uh, so this shows a broadband noise over the entire spectrum. And um, you see here those little uh, green bursts or bars. So these uh, bars representing the viper operation. So you can really uh, see over time uh, how your EOT, uh, let's say, behaves and you can get uh, the real disturbance characteristic uh, from your EOT. Yeah, uh, this uh, so far uh, for the introduction on uh, um, FFT-based receivers. Um, what else is uh, new in uh, edition 6? Uh, first, uh, we have introduced uh, appropriate limits for a measurement distance of uh, uh, 3 meter, and this is applicable for small equipment. And the de definition for small equipment is a cylindric volume of 1.2 meter in diameter and 1.5 meter in height, inclusive of the table. Um, it has also uh, introduced uh, for the first time figures showing the uh, test setup and there is a, a new requirement and this is uh, the use of, uh, uh, of CMATs. Uh, CMAT uh, stand for common mode absorption device and actually we're talking about a ferret type uh, CMAT which is uh, let's say clamped around the cables that are leaving the test volume. Why this is so important? Uh, because here we're talking about small equipment um, and with one or two or three cables attached. That means that the uh, radiated uh, emission is dominated by the cable and not uh, by the housing of the EOT. Um, in other words, we can say we have a kind of DOP-loaded uh, antenna. And for such, uh, let's say, uh, antenna, the impedance at the feed point is quite important. So that means uh, the impedance will influence uh, the measurement result. And um, this so far is uh, particularly important if you do measurements on different sides. Because uh, if you look to the cable length, which uh, defines the impedance uh, Behind the turntable, um, this is not defined. So if you go in from one room to another room, you may have a difference of several meters. And therefore, it's quite important to add this CMAT here at the cables leaving the test volume. And to give you some, some figures uh, in mind, um, without this CMAT, uh, in the low frequency range, we're talking here about 30 megahertz to 100, 150 megahertz. If you go from one lab to another lab with such a small EOT with only a few cables attached, you may see uh, 
deviation of up to 15 dB. Adding those ferrite clamps, it comes down to about 2 dB, which is really a, a good progress and uh, which really uh, reduces uh, the uncertainty belonging to this uh, measurement method. Yeah, um, then we have some um, uh, new requirements like uh, new limits. Uh, we have um, also uh, requirements for wireless power transfer equipment. Um, however, um, equipment like, um, let's say, um, um, a wireless toothbrush, this will not in the scope of CISPA 11. Of course, this will remain under uh, CISPA 14-1. Or let's talk about uh, a laptop computer with charging bed. This will remain under uh, CISPA 32. Yeah. Um, what is new? We have added uh, requirements for grid-connected uh, power converters. And those converters uh, are used uh, for uh, photovoltaic systems. And here we are using the concept of, um, 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 let's say, of conducted, uh, a concept of component testing. That means um, we uh, limit the uh, interference noise at the DC input. And if we do so at this point here, uh, we will not radiate any, uh, let's say, emission via the connected uh, uh, solar panels. Uh, for this purpose, uh, you need uh, a new type of uh, listen. Uh, it's a 150 ohm delta AN, also called as DC AN. Yeah, uh, another new, uh, let's say, requirement is the use of the APT measurement function. APT stands for Amplitude Probability uh, Distribution, and this is introduced as an alternative to log average uh, measurements by reducing the video bandwidth. Uh, doing so, uh, I mean, if you apply a video bandwidth of 10 hertz, uh, you will simply, let's say, um, this, uh, yeah, you will simply cut all the impulse noise, and you will not see the real disturbance characteristic. Um, with APD, you can uh, get the true average, and you see the real disturbance characteristic. Um, yeah. This so far for uh, edition six. Um, meanwhile, we have also uh, added a new amendment to edition 6. This is amendment 1. Uh, you see uh, it was published in June 2016 and uh, uh, in Europe uh, the DOW was assigned to um, 21st of April 2020. And this new amendment introduced the measurement uh, in a fully anechoic chamber. What is the motivation uh, for using a fully anechoic chamber below one gigahertz. Uh, you see here there is no antenna height scan. No antenna height scan means, means you can really speed up um, the measurement. So that is um, um, really a good approach. And of course, finally, uh, your chambers uh, can be smaller uh, because uh, you do not need the antenna tower for the height variation. Um, yeah, uh, for in CISPA 11, this is method is uh, applicable for tabletop equipment. Um, measurement distance is three meter, and uh, that means again only for small equipment with a diameter um, uh, less than 1.2 meter. Um, yeah, um, actually, what uh, is uh, new? We have also Amendment 2 now in place, and here we have a revision of the APT method. Uh, you see now, instead of two uh, frequency ranges, seven are required. Instead of a span of 10 megahertz, we have now 20 megahertz. Uh, this will end up in a measurement of uh, altogether five final frequencies instead of three. 
uh, measurement time will remain unchanged. And uh, the amendment was just published uh, earlier this year, January 18. Um, EN standard has not been published, so no, uh, the date of withdrawal was uh, uh, assigned. Yeah, uh, what's coming after edition six? Um, here we will have uh, addition of wireless power transfer equipment. So now we are talking uh, about, uh, let's say, for example, uh, WPT off-board power supply and charging equipment. Um, you see the yellow box, this is actually the EOT, and uh, we have to measure both uh, radiated emission and conducted emission in the frequency range uh, for radiated emission from 9K to 30 megahertz using a 60 centimeter loop antenna and the conducted uh, frequency range is 150K to 30 megahertz. And here we are uh, uh, measuring the common mode current by using um, a current probe. The Im important uh, fact is that uh, you need a kind of load. Um, um, of course, you can use a vehicle. Um, car manufacturer will most probably do that. But in a test house, you may not have, uh, uh, let's say, a um, um, vehicle as load. And so uh, it's also appropriate to use an artificial load uh, with this huge metal plate, which simulates uh, the uh, chassis of a car. Yeah. Um, this so far, the CISPR 11, let's continue with CISPR 14. So now we are talking about household appliances. And here we have sixth edition in place that was published in August uh, 2016. And in Europe, DOW was uh, set to uh, January 9, 2019. So it's just a couple of months in place. Uh, in other words, do not apply edition five anymore. What's new? Um, we have, in principle, a uh, general revision, and uh, also, uh, let's say, uh, we have uh, added uh, um, new methods for radiated emission. So, first of all, also for 14-1, uh, you can apply a fully anechoic uh, room for emission uh, testing uh, below 1 gigahertz. Um, we have also new requirements for the air conditioners and robotic vacuum cleaners and a battery powered remote controls. There is no more need uh, to do uh, re uh, emission measurements. And again, as same as for CISPR 11, use of CMATs. Um, edition 6 also has uh, updated the reference, uh, references to CISPR 16. Um, first, 16.1.1 use of uh, uh, FFT-based receivers. We discussed already, same as for CISPR 11. Um, we have also updated references to 16.1.2 on the listen requirements. In the past, we had only the requirement on the magnitude of the impedance. Now we have in addition phase uh, of the impedance, but also new requirements like isolation and attenuation. Uh, isolation is quite important uh, because if you connect, uh, you listen to the public grid, um, you do not know if there is any interference noise coming along the line which may have an uh, impact on your measurement result. With the isolation of 40 dB, uh, you are sure that those, uh, let's say, interferences uh, will not uh, uh, disturb your uh, measurement result. And finally, attenuation requirement of at least 10 dB for conducted uh, uh, emission measurements, that is uh, uh, quite reasonable to get uh, a good, uh, let's say, match uh, of 50 ohm uh, from uh, the listen to the receiver. Yeah, and uh, one more requirement, uh, evaluation procedure for the influence of uh, the setup table material. And also here I want to give you a, a little insight. Um, you see actually here, um, this is the, the measurement table. And the, the message here is, do not use a wooden table. Uh, wood is not a good material because uh, it changes the, uh, let's say, uh, the electric uh, characteristic um, depending on uh, is it wet or is it dry. Um, and it has a, a general a high permittivity. So uh, please do not use wood. Um, 
use uh, um, a material with a low permittivity. This uh, could be, for example, a styrofoam um, block with a Teflon plate on top. Um, on the end, you have to do a little measurement to check the influence of the material. Um, it's, it's more or less simple. You see you have here the table in one position. You use a, a small, um, let's say, a transmitter and uh, transmitting antenna, and this uh, is your receive antenna. And what you do is you do two measurements, one with and one without the table, um, taking the difference and uh, considering as an additional uh, uh, uncertainty budget. Yeah, um, then we have technical requirements for the telecommunication port. So these um, have to be uh, performed in accordance with CISPR 32. Um, we have the voltage probe measurements only on load terminals uh, with, for equipment with uh, associated equipment. And in particular, this I want to highlight, uh, extractor hoods. Um, extractor hoods, um, in the past, they had to measure twice. One with the fan operation against 14-1, and one with the light uh, operation against uh, CISPR 15. Today, it's more simple. You do one test, you switch on both uh, functions, fan and light, that's it, and you measure against 14-1. Um, yeah, and finally, we have here the full implementation of measurement instrumentation uncertainty. That means you have to consider the uncertainty uh, when you do the declaration uh, of conformance. Um, yeah, what's coming after edition six? Um, here, uh, we first we will see an extension of the frequency range for radiated disturbance measurements. Um, up to 6 gigahertz. Uh, however, this uh, extension is conditional. And uh, that means only if your highest clock frequency is larger than 1 gigahertz, you have to measure uh, up to 6. Uh, if it is less than 108 megahertz, um, there uh, is enough uh, to measure up to 1 gig. Um, yeah, we will also have a clarification on click measurements. Um, this is uh, here particular for introducing uh, four-channel click analyzers based on FFT uh, technology. Such uh, equipment can be used for testing, and the good thing is with the four-channel uh, versus the one-channel, actually you um, ha save measurement times uh, by a factor of four. Um, typical um, click measurement takes two hours, uh, for one frequency, for all four frequency, that would mean eight hours, not so with uh, FFT-based receivers. That can measure all four channels in parallel, uh, so um, two hours, that is, that's it. Um, there's a clarification on the use of such four-channel uh, equipment. Um, first, you have to calculate the click rate for uh, each of the four frequencies and also the limit uh, relaxation is based on the click rate calculation for the four frequencies. Amendment one is expected in 2020. Um, yeah, uh, next uh, let's talk about CISPR 15, lighting equipment. And here we have actually a quite new edition, uh, edition nine, published in May 2018. Uh, EN55015 has not been published yet. Uh, so we're waiting for the publication. What's new in this edition 9? Uh, so we have here uh, a general revision and restructuring. Uh, we introduced a port concept, um, wired network, local wired and enclosure port, and this is applied to all kind of uh, lighting uh, equipment. And doing so, we have a more technology independent approach, which is really an improvement uh, comparing to the previous uh, edition. Um, yeah, what are the, the uh, technical changes? First, we uh, will see an extension of the frequency range uh, for radiated emission up to one gig. Um, we have uh, deleted uh, the insertion loss requirement um, and uh, associated Annex uh, A. Um, New, uh, we see new conducted measurement method for so-called GO10, self-ballasted lamps. Um, 
we have added the current probe measurement uh, for some uh, cases. And uh, this is particular of interest because if your, uh, let's say, lamp is quite large, it may not fit in this two meter large loop antenna system um, because uh, the equipment size for such an antenna is limited to 1.6 meter. And um, for doing measurements on larger equipment, uh, please use a 60 centimeter loop antenna um, and you do this in a, in an anechoic chamber, semi-anechoic chamber um, for uh, doing the measurements. Yeah, um, what else? CDN E-method. Actually, uh, we had in the previous edition uh, the CDN, um, which was based on IEC 61000-4-6. Uh, but I have to tell you, um, such CDN is not suitable for emission measurements. Um, for emission measurements, we need a coupling that uh, network with enhanced specification. So here, particular, I'm talking about um, an, uh, let's say, additional phase requirement for the common mode impedance, differential mode impedance, but also uh, requirements for the longitudinal conversion loss. Um, on the end, the, uh, the CDNE method is an alternative method, and it is limited um, based on the highest clock frequency of the EOT. So if it is uh, below or equal to 30 megahertz, you can use the CDNE method. If the clock frequency is higher, you have to perform radiated emission measurements. Um, also, from the point of view of the EOT sites, uh, the method is limited. So uh, please use only for equipment which is smaller than 3 by 1 by 1 meter. And finally, uh, the limits are more stringent, so you have uh, an increased margin of 10 dB at 300 megahertz. Yeah, um, last but not least, multimedia equipment. So this is actually the biggest change we have seen in the last couple of years. Uh, it's a major replacement of CISPR 1322 and uh, 55103 into new CISPR 32. Um, first edition was already published in 2012 and become, became applicable uh, in, on 5th March uh, 2017. Um, what's new? FFT-based receivers? Yes, of course. Um, professional equipment is in the scope. Um, radio transmission function is excluded. We use a port concept. Yes, uh, similar to what I told you um, for uh, CISPR uh, 15, you see here the port concept. Um, so this is your equipment, and we have uh, uh, established requirements for each port, like the mains port, wired network port, um, tuner ports. But look at this. Also, fiber ports uh, may become an issue if they have uh, metallic uh, uh, tension. Yeah, um, measurement instrumentation uncertainty for the moment only calculation and reporting. Uh, radiated disturbance up to 6 gig. Uh, disturbance power measurement not required anymore. And this is uh, here quite an uh, important statement. If you uh, do a retest, uh, you have to uh, apply the test mod method original choosing. Yeah, for example, uh, you measure in 3 meter and uh, 10 meter. Uh, if you repeat the test, then um, you have to uh, set the distance as done in the first uh, measurement. Um, yeah, meanwhile, we have edition 2 published. Uh, was, uh, let's say, um, uh, in March 15 and became mandatory, mandatory in Europe uh, May 5, uh, 2018. Uh, so what are the changes here? Uh, CISPR average detector is required. Um, we added outdoor units for home satellite receivers. Uh, also here, again, fully anechoic room um, um, for measurements below 1 gigahertz. So remember, no antenna height scan. So it's a, a good progress in uh, context of time saving. Um, we have a clarification on the setup. So you may have equipment which you can put on the floor, uh, mount on the wall, uh, lay on the table. Only one measurement, so please consider it as tabletop. 
Um, and we have two uh, new uh, informative annexes. One is on the TEM waveguide and one on the reverberation chamber. Um, both uh, are informative, that means can be used for pre-compliance testing. Um, it may have some, some uh, benefit, uh, look at uh, if you have very small multimedia equipment, battery operated with no cable attached, so that you can measure in a TM waveguide, which is of course much, uh, let's say, um, cheaper than an anechoic chamber. Yeah, uh, what's coming in future editions? Um, here, uh, first of all, uh, we will also see the full implementation of measurement instrumentation uncertainty. So again, uncertainty have to be considered uh, when you do the determination of compliance. Um, we have also an alternative measurement on the telecommunication port. So you may measure here the power spectrum density mask in accordance with ITU instead of applying uh, AAN. Um, introduction of RMS average as an alternative to quasi-peak and average detector. So this is also a, a big step forward um, to better consider the impact of uh, impulse noise on today's widely used uh, digital radio service. Um, wireless power transfer will be added. So, you know, we have the um, laptop computers with WBT pads. So this is under the scope of 32. And uh, termination of cables. Uh, we discussed that already uh, under 11 and 14-1. Um, you see uh, CISPR 32 is going a slightly different approach. They will introduce uh, a VHF listen rather than an absorbing clamp. And uh, that is uh, justified by uh, have uh, a optimum, uh, optimum impedance for the mains uh, line. Uh, using a ferrite clamp is always a compromise, so, uh, but it's a good compromise. It's easy to apply and the uh, impedance, let's say, is a good, um, let's say, match for um, different type of cables like mains, uh, signal cables or telecommunication cables. And we have a clarification on the color par test pattern. Also here I like to give you a short insight. Um, uh, you see that is the so-called uh, multi-zone test pattern in accordance with uh, ITU uh, 1725. Um, we have also a color bar test pattern in the same standard, and uh, we have uh, the old 4x3 uh, uh, um, analog uh, color bar test pattern according to ITU 471. Um, so on the end for emission testing, it's not a, a big deal, so you can use... Uh, uh, one uh, of those uh, three options. Um, yeah, and uh, we expect a change uh, in the measurement method above one gigahertz. Um, so here um, it may be requ uh, required to perform um, an antenna height scan above one gigahertz. And um, um, this will, of course, will have an impact on both the measurement side and the equipment because now you need an antenna tower to uh, adjust the height, and uh, that means you need a, a chamber which is uh, high enough to cover the height scan range from one to four meter. So this is justified uh, by results showing that you may not capture the maximum emission if you measure on a fixed height. Yeah, um, this so far for uh, today's uh, CISPR news, um, I hope that you um, got uh, a lot of information you can use in your daily work. Um, please ask questions. For the moment, I say thank you very much.